Welcome. Welcome to the Ferguson Library. Um, my name is Alice Knapp, and I'm president of the library. And as I talk, if you could take a moment to just silence your phones. I think it's fairly ironic that I'm here to welcome you during Innovation Week and to talk about a new speaker series, but I myself am reading notes. <laughs> so bear with me. This, this really came out of um, our the overwhelming success we had at TEDx last March. And what we found out is within two hours, we sold out all of the available seats to, to host there. Um, we found out some other things about charging and maybe not charging. But in fact, we had over um, 100 people sign up for TEDx within two hours. And then that day of TEDx, not only did we have fabulous speakers, but we found part of the audience were there to pitch their speech for the next TEDx event. And we found out that there was a whole community of speakers, professional speakers, within Stanford and the surrounding communities. So what we did we, um, is that we, we talked to that, that community of speakers and we knew that we at the library, we wanted to foster this. And so this is the beginning of that. Um, we, this is the first night of a three-part series. Um, it's our interactive speaker series. Tonight is Brian Mattimore, of course. He's kicking this off with the ideation, inspiration, and innovation of speakers. October 18th, Lynn Cottrella, um, we, along with some professional actors, will be now you're, ta now you're talking, hands-on comical inspiration for speakers. And if any of you have done comic improv, you know speaking's a lot e easier after you've impersonated a frog hopping across the room. November 29th, three veterans of Ferguson TEDx speakers will share the art and craft of memor memor more memorable presentations, <laughs> superpowers from TEDx speakers with Sharabri Ahmed, Sean Bromley, and Sebastian Otto. Um, all of these events are on our website, and if you sign up for our email newsletters, you can find out more about them. But that's not all. <laughs> We know that there are professional speakers within Stanford, so we're designing a new speaker group. And it's the professional speakers group. It's designed for authors and presenters who are already making money giving talks and want to further enhance their speaking business. This pro group kicks off next Friday afternoon, and this is something that you actually apply for, and um, professional speakers are vetting the applicants. And again, you can find out more information on our website. And the inspiring speakers group is for people who want to learn to improve their speaking skills. This group will kick off next March. So if you're interested in either of these groups, go to our website or give us your name in the, the back, back to sign up. So tonight is Brian Mattimore. Um, I always feel like if you go to something cool, Brian is there. But he is co-founder and chief idea guy at Growth Engine, a 19-year-old innovation agency based in Norwalk, Connecticut. He's given over 200 keynote speeches, including his well-received TED Talks, TED Talk, Creative Techniques to Solve Impossible Challenges, here at the Ferguson Library this past March. Brian has also facilitated over 1,000 idea generation sessions and creative focus groups, leading to over 3 billion in new product successes. Brian is the author of three books, two of which will be on sale tonight in the back, Idea Stormers, How to Lead and Inspire Creative Breakthroughs, published by Wiley, Jossie, and Bass, which includes entertaining real-world stories of his company's innovation consulting successes and the techniques he used to help his clients create them. And his newest book, 21 Days to a Big Idea, which is a daily creative thinking exercise program for current and aspiring entrepreneurs to help them create the next big thing for a new entrepreneurial venture. And with that, I'm handing it over to Brian. Thank you, okay. All right, great. Thank you. So October 8th, 2012 was a big day in my life. Uh, my book, my second book, Idea Stormers, was published that day. When you write a book, they have a, quote, publication day. So that was the date. And so I was at the office waiting for the phone to ring, of course, right? Well, the phone actually did ring. It only rang once, but it did ring. And it was uh, Joan Levy, who is the special projects director at the Chicago Public Library. 
and she had called. They were doing uh, that May, May 2013, an all staff retreat. And I don't know if you know, but the Chicago Public Library closes down all day, one day during the year, so all the staff can come to the main library and be enriched by speakers, etc. So the, the theme that year was innovation and creativity, and she called and said, would you like to speak at that, that event? And you would be the only outside speaker outside of Chicago. Um, and I said, of course. And I said, and she said, we've seen your book. And, uh, we've, and I said, well, how did you find out about the book so quickly? And of course, she said, well, we are librarians. So, you know, we know. Um, so I went out there. And what they did, and anybody recognize this? These are not trick questions. This is the Chicago Public Library, okay, where I spoke. Um, it was built in 1991, $144 million. It's gorgeous. Up top there you can see uh, the sculptures. They're owls. They're 12-foot owls with books in their mouths that represent wisdom and growth. There's 75 miles of books within that library. And they asked me to speak in this atrium. And there were... Uh, they set up 200, chair, 200 chairs and tables, and they, so they would have three rounds. There were 600 people that were at this event, so they had three rounds. So I spoke three times that day for an hour, and we decided we should have something interactive. And so I asked if uh, five audience members could come up and invent a new product in, five, in 30 seconds or less and that I would help them do that. And I was surprised. They, we did get five volunteers, and they all successfully did that. They all invented a new invention in 30 seconds, each round of five. And so how did I get them to do that, sort of like a magic trick? And it was pretty simple, actually. I gave them words, cards with words on them. There were nouns and adjectives, and I asked them to mash those together, and they created a new invention. So, for instance, if you have the word wreath, let's say, on one card, and on the other card you have adjectives and nouns like waterbed, guitar, buckle, liquid field, smelly, and angled, if you mash up one of those, you're gonna probably get an interesting idea. Right? What's an, what's an angled wreath, a smelly wreath, a, a, a liquid filled wreath, all of a sudden you're probably there, right? So they all succeeded, and the point of that was what? It's important to, quote, define ourselves as creative. And all the work that I've done in my life is really about introducing techniques to people to help them, quote, recognize, realize, and manifest their own creativity. And so that's what we're going to share with you today. Some, some techniques, if you will, to pull out your own inherent creativity, but specifically around speaking. So as I thought about this talk, and I probably spent, believe it or not, 12 hours preparing this talk, uh, it seems like a long time, right? But I, I've never given this talk, so uh, I, and I really began to enjoy thinking about what I should share with you guys. And so I thought about it, and I decided to do design three TED Talks, almost, three 15-minute segments. And so that's what we have here. The first talk is on thought leader. The second is on, this is you thought leader, you storyteller, and you original idea creator. Okay? So that's what we're up to. By the way, I don't know if you noticed, but I started with a story. A lot of TED Talks start with stories, right? You may also notice, well, you wouldn't know this, but if, if you haven't seen my TEDx talk that I gave, uh, that library story was not in the TEDx talk. Even though I wanted to tell it, why wasn't it in there? It took, a, it took sort of a long time to tell, and I had five better stories. And so if and when you do your own TEDx, you're going to find you're going to have to cut out a lot to get to that 17 or 18 minute mark, just so you know, okay? And it's hard. You're killing your children, just like writers, right? It's hard to cut out those talk, those uh, stories you like. So let's do the thought leader one. Um, I've identified five strategies for becoming a thought leader. Now, why is this important if you're talking about a TEDx talk? 
because you've got to have some thoughts. You've got to have something original to share, right? This is the whole idea. You're going to give something to the audience, hopefully that they've never heard before. And so this is all about uniqueness and unique contributions that you're going to make to the audience. And so these are the things that I'm going to share with you to hopefully help you do that if you don't have your subject already. Now, by the way, you probably know there are dozens, if not, there, there are quite a few books out there on how to give a TED talk. The best one is probably by Chris Anderson. But they don't, they tell you how to structure it, how to think about it, and all the rest. But not many of them, or none as far as I know, tell you how to get the idea for the talk, the original idea. They kind of assume you have that. So that's what, that's what I thought I would work on with you guys today. So here we go. I have five strategies for thought leadership. Uh, the first one, conduct and publicize original research. So, and, and forgive me, I'm going to personalize all this stuff because I, I sort of know me, I don't know you, but hopefully you'll get it by example what I'm talking about here, okay? So, we've, I've personally facilitated over a thousand ideation sessions. My com company has done uh, 1,500. Well, there's probably something original in that number of ideation sessions that we could share with the world, right? Maybe we go through and analyze what are the absolute best techniques, what are the most productive. By the way, if you don't know that term ideation, it's the current term for, quote, brainstorming, okay? So, um, so there's probably something there. So can, do you have something original research that you've done or that you know about that you could turn into your talk? That's strategy one. Strategy two, invent a new process or methodology. Uh, so we invented a technique called patent prompts. Um, and this was to help our clients come up with new uh, inventions. Uh, you may or may not know, but the U.S. Patent Office has now gone online, so you can search by keywords. And so we use analogies to trigger new ideas. And so we would search. If we, we had a challenge to invent a new fuse box, right? Good luck with that. And it's hard, right? Um, but what we did was we put in uh, words like connect or flow. We got abstracts of patents, right, outside of the world of fuse boxes. This is all about principle transfer. And we got our clients then to take those abstracts, transfer the principles, and use those to trigger new ideas. And so that's a new fuse box. Um, a third area uh, that can help you with your talk, create quotable quotes, right? Yeah? So for me, uh, forgive me, I've created four original quotes for you guys, okay? Uh, the first one is, actually we created this quite a while ago, and this has gotten quite a bit of press and articles we've done. You don't innovate by changing a company's culture, you change the culture by innovating. I realize it sounds very JFK-like, but um, that's actually an important thought. When we do our consulting work, we don't go in there and tell, we gotta fix your process. No, we go in there, have them invent new stuff, and from that derive the process. And that's very different than McKinsey or BCG or any of these, those guys. So that's a quote from me. Uh, if, you wanna, if you want more ideas, find more problems. At home, no, just in general, okay? Okay. Another quote, if you're having trouble creating a good, good idea, create a lot of bad ones. Uh, that actually does work. There are a lot of techniques out there where you actually come up with bad ideas and turn them into good ones, and I'm going to share a TEDx uh, talk that actually, in my opinion, did that. And then finally, if you're good at principal identification and transfer, you have what it takes to be a genius. And I really do believe that, and frankly, we all have that capacity to transfer um, principles to, to create new inventions, for instance. If you look at the history of invention, most inventors did it through principal transfer. Samuel Colt, when he invented the six-shooter revolver, saw a ship's wheel turning, tra translated that principle to the six-shooter revolver and invented it. Uh, Eli Whitney, you may or may not know, when he was trying to invent the cotton gin, saw a cat reaching through a fence trying to grab a chicken and transferred that principle to invent the cotton gin. Okay, make predictions about your industry or the thing that you want to talk about. You make predictions, everybody thinks, wow, all right. So one of the predictions I made, this was probably seven or eight years ago, that global virtual ideation 
would start to happen. What is that? You know, and I had a bias, frankly, that ideation or brainstorming had to be done within the groups. But we had a client, a large pharmaceutical company uh, with a pain reliever, uh, internationally known pain reliever, and they said, can you help us invent new packaging, new products, new distribution ideas, et cetera, for this pain reliever, and we have 18 offices worldwide. And while we have a master brand, that's a brand that goes across all these countries, we need to tailor this to the unique cultures, right? So Germany, obviously, uh, or the US, we have a 200 count of aspirin, right? And we don't think, we don't have a second thought about buying a 200 count. In India, they package them in twos because it's too expensive, but they want to so that the husband can take those pills and go to work the next day because they can't afford not to have him work. And so the cultures are very, very different. So how do you ideate with those 18 cultures? Well, you do it virtually. And we now have the technology to do that. And so that was a trend I predicted. And, and so the Washington Post interviewed me. Actually, uh, the article came out in July about that prediction. It took seven years, but you know, it's now become uh, an important thing. If anyone wants to know more about this, I can tell you more afterwards. And finally, and this is, I think, one of the most important for thought leadership, is look for intersections and connections between different categories and disciplines. And so we do, do this all the time in our work when we're trying to invent a new product. We had assignments with Oreo and Chips Ahoy cookies, right? And so how do you invent a new Oreo or Chips Ahoy cookie? Those brands have been around for, anybody know? The Oreo has been around for over a hundred years, right? And so you go in there and you say, who's got some, some cookie ideas that are gonna throw you out of the room? So you have to bring process to trigger those ideas. How do we trigger those ideas? Um, you combine the thing you're interested with other categories of foods is one approach. So cookies and ice cream, cookies and cake, and cookies and brownie. And this is the one I talked about in the, the TEDx talk. Um, by the way, this has become a big deal for them, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, I, I was in the store and a woman was buying this and I said, you know, why are you buying that? And she's like, it's a brownie inside of a chocolate chip cookie. You know, like I was kind of nuts, right? Of course, it's a brownie. But now it's become what's called a platform. So now they have Fudge, and they figured out how to put a layer inside these things. So now they have fudge, red velvet cake, right? And they've even put Oreo fillings in there. Okay, so that's your, your thought leadership. But I want to stay on this connections between disciplines for a second, because this is, this is really the way you get to be perceived as a genius or a Nobel Prize winner. So, So you can just take a bunch of disciplines, right? And you start mashing these things up, right? So sports and psychology, obviously it's a current discipline. What about sports and horticulture? I don't know what that would be, right? Um, sports and architecture, there's probably something there. Okay, so this guy got the Nobel Prize uh, last year uh, by linking in two different disciplines. Anybody recognize this guy? Seems like a nice guy, right? Okay. So let's, anybody want to take a shot at which two disciplines he linked? We'll put them all up here. Psychology and economics is one guess. Anybody have another guess? Psychology and medicine, good guess. We have a third one, third guess. All of them, no, I, but I like that, thank you. <laughs> That's kind of cool, I like that. It, what's that? Architecture and peace, I like that one too. Um, it was actually psychology and economics. It's Richard Thaler, he got the uh, Nobel Prize in economics for behavioral um, psychology. Um, uh, in his work he talks about um, uh, SIFs. 
supp supposedly irrelevant human factors, and he called them SIFs, and SIFs are, the point was what? They're not irrelevant, and that's why we as humans will often act irrationally. Okay, so um, in your world, if you have a passion for something, see what you can mash it up with, right? I guarantee you, you're going to be getting original and really cool ideas. And if that doesn't work, call me up. I'll help you through it. I'm, I'm serious. Okay. So, that is the first of our three TEDx talks. How do we do time-wise? I think we did pretty well. All right? By the way, they're really tough on time. Yeah. <laughs> Sean Browley is, is laughing because, <laughs> because he went a little over and it was a drag. So, when you do these things, you want to... I practice my TEDx talk at least 20 times. Uh, Mary Abbasio is here. We live in the same neighborhood. She'd see me walking around talking to myself and finally she came up to me and said, what's going on? I said, well, I'm, I'm practicing my TEDx talk. I'm not nuts, you know. Um, okay, so we got storytellers the next. So as you know, if you're going to give a talk, I can't imagine you succeeding without having some stories in there. I just, I, it's hard for me to imagine that there are not some stories in your, going to be some stories in your talk. And I want to share with you two I think, wonderful examples of how to create a story. Now, these are fiction-oriented, but they have the same mechanisms, I believe, and, and sort of timeless principles around what makes a good story. Sort of the beginning, middle, and end, right? But a little more sophisticated than that. So, um, anybody know who Fran Stryker was? Uh, where did he get his story? Anybody recognize that name? There's, there's no reason you should. Um, I was fortunate to be able to get his autobiography from the Ferguson Library. They had to order it by interpublic um, loan, interlibrary loan, because it's not easy to find, but I did get it. And um, he is one of the most prolific writers this country has ever seen. In fact, he was the most pro prolific radio play writer that we have ever seen. Okay, for one of his characters, I'm going to show you the character in a second, he did 2,952 half-hour radio plays over a 30-year period. 2,952. If you do the math, that's one every three days, probably. Okay, so the question is, how did he do that? Well, first of all, what was it? What did he create? Um, one of them was Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. Am I only the old person here who knows that? Okay. Uh, the other one, which you all know, is the Green Hornet. So he created the Green Hornet. And the most famous one is coming up. Anybody want to take a shot at it? The Shadow, great guess. The Lone Ranger. Okay, and these are books that he wrote. It's like he had extra time after doing the radio plays, right? These are some of the books he wrote. Um, so the story here, which is so wonderful, is how did he create all these ideas, right? And there was some, there was some rumblings or some hints within the creativity literature. And I'm reading radio histories, and they, they seem to imply that he used a technique of, they called it morphological analysis. And that came from the world of science. And, and the idea was you sort of take things down into pieces and optimize each of those pieces, and that he was maybe combining those pieces to come up with story ideas. And so that was the, 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 the myth or the lore about this guy. And so I decided to try to find out if that was actually true. And I found all these clues. Long story short, I discovered that he did teach a course at the university, excuse me, at the Buffalo YWCA, yes, in 1962. Creative Writing Workbook and the Morphological Approach to Plotting by Fran Stryker, copyright 1962. He died. I believe that year. So he gave the course and then died soon after. This is a 70 page workbook. How did I get a hold of it? I did all this research. I was told it might be at the University of Buffalo Special Collections. And I call up 
Could you connect me? Could you connect me? Could you connect me? Yes, hello. Is this Special Collections? Yes, it is. Hi, this is Brian Mattamore. I'm wondering, would you have Fran Stryker's 70-page uh, workbook from the creative writing uh, course he taught on morphological analysis at the, at the uh, Buffalo YWCA in 1962? Well, yes, we do have that. I couldn't believe it. And so I got a copy of it. And so here for you is the important thing. This is, this is the most important page in the manuscript, in my opinion. Elements of a plot. And this is how he did it. So, and it's not hard. You list some characters. You can see the list on the left there. Carpenter, clerk, clerk playboy, prospector, sailor, taxi driver. In any dramatic thing, you've got to what? They've got to want something, right? So what's the objective? If you're a sailor, what do you want? Power, pride, life. I don't see opposite sex up there, but whatever. Deformity, fear, hardship, loneliness, whatever it is. Okay, so you've got this character and objective, then what? You gotta have an obstacle if you're gonna have drama, right? So you lit with some obstacles, he pit, pitted against authority, lack of clothing, <laughs> courage, whatever it is. And then finally what? You gotta have a solution. So how, do, how does the, the, the protagonist solve this? Through prayer, through cunning, through courage, through sacrifice, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the process he used to create all these, these stories, okay? So, what I've done is I've written an article about how to do this. It was in Do-It-Yourself MFA. And in your handouts, uh, which are available both in hard copy and online, it has a link to this article that will talk you through basically how to do that. So that's one way. Here's a second way, all right? And this is a little more current. Um, so this is cracking the story code at Pixar. This is a, a, a woman named Emma Coates. This was in, she was in her early 20s. She's now at Google. Um, and she cracked the code, if you will, for how Pixar creates the plots for their movies, all right? And there's six steps to this, right? But it's only 20 words. And the first step has like six words. It's only 18 words, excuse me. So we only got 12 words left, okay? So once upon a time there was, every day, so once upon a time there was, fill in the blank. I'm going to fill in the blanks for you here for Finding Nemo, just so you know, okay? So once a time upon a time there was, every day, blank, one day, now we've got a shift, right? Something's happening, one day. So that's established what's, you know, our current state. Something's gonna happen one day. Because of that, this thing that happened, right? Something else happened. Because of that, that, right? And then finally, until finally. And that's it. That's all you got. So here we go. Once upon a time, there was a widowed fish named Marlin who was extremely protective of his only son, Nemo. Every day, Marlin warned Nemo of the ocean's dangers and implored him not to swim far away. Is this ringing any bells? We've all seen Finding Nemo, right? One day, in an act of defiance, Nemo does what? He ignores his father's warnings and swims into the open water. Because of that, and I love this line, he is captured by a diver and ends up in the fish tank of a dentist in Sydney. <laughs> right? Can you imagine? Okay. Because of that, Marlin sets off on a journey to recover Nemo, enlisting the help of other sea creatures along the way. Until finally, Marlin and Nemo find each other, reunite, and learn that love depends on trust. Half a billion dollars later, everybody's happy with the sale, okay? All right, so pretty much everything I do, I validate for myself or I have to practice it myself. And we'll talk more about that with one of my books. So I felt I had to apply this story formula to create a story for you guys. So here we go. This is about finding not Nemo, but inspiration. Once upon a time in the land of Brainstormia, Give me a break, I'm, but stay with me here. There was a shortage of truly breakthrough ideas, okay? 
Every day, the people of Brainstormia would, quote, generate lots of ideas by withholding judgment, but none of these ideas were very different or exciting. That's the definition of brainstorming, right? There are no bad ideas, which is not correct. Most of the ideas are bad. But uh, withhold judgment and generate a lot of ideas. Those are the two principles of brainstorming, OK? But, they, but it basically doesn't work. Research has showed brainstorming doesn't work, OK? And we can talk more about that if you want. But it's because you're not stimulating the brain in unique ways, OK? One day, a stranger, AKA a consultant, <laughs> came to town with a magic book that contained dozens of ingenious new idea generation techniques. Because of that, the people of Brainstormia were now inspired and able to create a wide range of breakthrough new ideas. Because of that, the kingdom of Brainstormia, now renamed Ideastormia, um, became the most successful and fun kingdom in the land in which to live and work. Until finally, the people of Ideastormia realized the only way to have lasting prosperity and happiness and stay ahead of the other kingdoms <laughs> was to continually use their magic idea generation techniques to create breakthrough new ideas. Hold your applause. No, I'm kidding. And as maybe absurd or as silly as this exercise is, if I had done this, frankly, before I gave my TEDx talk, I think it would have been a better talk. Because in my talk, Creative Techniques to Solve Impossible Challenges, I gave the how-tos of all these techniques, but I didn't ladder up to a bigger thought of changing the world. And that's what I could have and probably should have done. And so, I don't know if you know, but certain TEDx talks, a certain small percentage, less than 1%, maybe, are are uh, listed on the, the Big Ted website. And that's how you get a million views of things, right? Well, I'm at 1,000, which is fine. It's OK. But, but if you're looking to get a million, I think you probably want to ladder up or have a bigger theme that you're talking about here than just a how-to. And had I done this exercise, I probably would have. OK. That's our second TEDx talk, right on time here. The third one, original idea creator. So we have dozens and dozens of different ideation techniques that we use with our clients to help them come up with new ideas. Um, we've invented a bunch of them. Uh, the patent prompts is one example. Uh, triggered brain walking is another. We're constantly inventing new techniques and or figuring out how to customize uh, known techniques to help our clients get new ideas. So I thought I would share a few of these techniques, but link them specifically to TEDx talks. And so this was really fun doing the research. How did I do the research? I wrote in TEDx and I put in questions because questions is, a, is an important uh, category of techniques. By the way, there are four major categories of ideation techniques. Questions, metaphors, visuals, right? And what are called fantasy techniques. We, and if you're interested, the books all talk about these and categorize those techniques, etc. Okay. We don't have time for all that. I'm going to share a few of these with you, okay? So questions. Uh, by the way, the three techniques that we use um, mostly in our work, uh, the three questioning techniques we use are 20 questions, problem redefinition, and questioning assumptions. In my TEDx talk, I focus, for instance, on problem redefinition, and we use that to help a life insurance company that only sells life insurance to Catholics. Yes, that's true. And they use that one technique and increase sales by 52%. And as I said in the talk, we definitely undercharged, right? Because it was about a $100 million company. OK. So those are, those are, the tech, those are some of the techniques. Um, and I said, well, has somebody given a talk on the importance of questions in, in TED? And I'm thinking there probably was. So I did that search. And this guy came up. This was last night, late at night. <laughs> this guy came up. I'm freaked out, right? So this guy is Michael Vsauce Stevens. I'd never heard of him. Apparently, he has like 5 million or more people um, following his, his blog. And what does he do on a, his, his, the talk of his TEDx uh, talk? And by the way, all of these are TEDx talks. So they were not in Vancouver, not the main stage at TED. They were all local TEDx talks. And by the way, this guy has, he did this in 2014. He has over 3 million hits now. Okay, 
And so he asked questions, and these are what would be called explanatory talks. They're persuasive talks. If you get the TED uh, book from Chris Anderson, um, who is the head of TED, he will talk about all the different kinds of talks you can give and how to structure them. But this is an explanatory talk. So um, his talk was, why do we ask questions? And by the way, the talk starts terribly. He starts telling puns at the beginning of it, like cheese puns. I'm like, oh my god, I can't watch this thing. But then as you start watching, it was pretty good. And the link to this is on the handout as well. So how much does a shadow weigh was, was one of the questions. And he would get into it in a very deep way, talking to physicists, et cetera, to figure that out. Why are things creepy? You know, a doll with a funky face. You know, why is that creepy? Why do we perceive that as creepy as humans? Um, and, you know, he's, he likes puns and where, what, what, why is the bottom in the middle of your body? But he, then he really researched things. And as I listened to his talk, he addressed what I thought was the, the most confounding subject that I, 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 I can, and it's not traffic. Why is there traffic when there's no accident backed up? That's one of them. But the second one, even more confounding to me, is how I can put my earphones in my bag or my computer cable in my bag and I take it out and it's all what? Tangled. How does that happen? It's like Toy Story. They're in there, you know, tangling up. He has researched that, he said, in this talk. So I'll have to go find out why. I don't know why. You'll have to go find out, too. Okay. So he built this whole thing around questions. That was his TEDx talk. All right? A second thing is wishing. All right? Let me just, I'm going to take a little excursion here on wishing, because it is very powerful, and we as adults don't do enough wishing. Okay? So... Um, I wish I could breathe underwater like a fish. You know, a kid might, drink, yeah? Well, there's now a underwater breathing apparatus that doesn't, doesn't store oxygen, but extracts it from the water the way gills do. Cool, right? Um, I wish someone would carry my luggage for me. Sure, why not, right? Okay, so there, I don't know if you've seen this, a hands-free suitcase that falls close behind, even when the user, you know, like the, right? Okay. So, um, just quickly, to show that it's real, we, we have an, uh, had an assignment with Thomas's, help him invent new what? English muffins. And so the wish was what? Target market wishing, people wish for what? A healthier English muffin, right? This is not rocket science. So um, this is what came out of all that wishing. Uh, it now, rep and, and this was not an easy sell, because Thomas's English muffins have been around for 100 years, and the senior manager said, a brown English muffin? What are you, crazy? Yeah, um, but this now represents over 30% of their business and it's margined up their business significantly because you as cons shoppers will do what? You'll pantry load or pantry freeze, right? You'll, they'll be on sale, you'll buy 20 of these things, put them in the freezer, right? So this has margined up the business. Okay, so, well, and again, I push this stuff on myself. What are some wishes I have? I wish I could be someone famous for a day. We'll, we'll not so go analyze that. I'm just sharing it. Uh, I wish I knew the people, friends that strangers and I have in common. I do think at some point in the future we'll all have little tags on and it'll link up with other people. And if you can t either turn it off and on, we're getting a shaking head, but I'll go with it. And, and it will tell us the, you know, 30 people we have in common and maybe the closest people we have in common. So if you really want to talk to someone and make a connection, it will say, you know, these five people. Uh, when you're on the plane, it's, oh my God, you know, the, 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 right? So I do think that'll happen. That's a pretty, pretty easy one. And then I wish I really knew what my body needed to eat at any moment in time to make it as healthy as it can be. These are just some of my wishes. Okay. So um, I wanted to store, share with you the genesis of the newest book, 21 Days to a Big Idea. How did that happen? Um, Bob Dorf, who is a Stanford resident, some of you may know Bob, he was one of the pioneers of the lean innovation movement, he's a great guy, teaches at Columbia, came to me, we're friends, he said, can you help my students invent better ideas for their ventures? Because only about 8% are any good. Could you come up with a process to do that? So that was a wish, right? And so, I said, I was going, that's supposedly me there, I'm going on vacation, and I said, let me think about it, uh, which I did. And I came up with an idea. I gave myself the task of coming up with a big idea every day for 21 days, which turns out to be really hard. Okay, it was not easy. 
But I did that and I watched my own process, because I know ideation process, all the things I did to trigger those big ideas, including buying weird magazines and trends. You know, I'm coming home with 17 magazine. My wife is like, uh, dear, you know, what's going on? You know. Um, so I did this experiment on myself, but I watched the process that, that I did, and so that's what I formalized in this book, so that aspiring entrepreneurs and current entrepreneurs can, quote, get their next big idea going through this process. And the idea is that if you generate a big idea for every day for 21 days, the chances are one of those ideas is going to be a really big idea, right? That's the idea here, okay? So that's, that's how that book got created, and it started with a wish, all right? Okay, so now into the TED Talk. This is uh, Kyle Schwartz. She's a third grade teacher in Denver, Colorado. Anybody know where she gave her TEDx talk? Kyoto, Japan. So you may have to go outside of Stanford if you want to do a TEDx talk, but hopefully not to Japan. So she was in Japan. She gave this talk. Um, and the title of the talk was, I wish my teacher knew. Okay? And so this is the wish technique incarnate, right? I wish my teacher knew. All right? And these are happy kids. Unfortunately, this is not that happy a story. It ends happy, but uh, this is what triggered her. This is, the actu this is a photo of the actual uh, thing that triggered her. This was crumpled up and thrown in a garbage can in her classroom. A kid had written down, I wish my teacher, these are third graders, yes, so the spelling we're working on, I wish my teacher knew I don't have pencils at home to do my homework. Oh my God, it breaks your heart, right? 91% of her students are in some kind of financial aid situation, right? And she pulled this out of the garbage can, read it, and she, she had a eureka moment because she realized, I'm talking to their brains, but I'm not dealing with the whole person here. And the emotions of kids are very important, and they can be uh, learning opportunities for them as well if we explore those emotions and what they're dealing with. And this has become somewhat of a movement now. The teachers are doing this with their students. I'll just share one more. This was another teacher in the school. I wish Mrs. King knew that I, was, uh, that I worry because my mom is getting sick a lot and was in the hospital last night. Oh my gosh, right? Okay. So her talk, she's a third grade teacher. She started this movement. It's covered in the, the Denver whatever the name of the paper is there. Uh, it's become so, somewhat of a national movement, and she has a half a million hits on her TEDx talk so far. We've laddered up to a bigger idea here, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> this is a fun one. Okay, so the, the last one I share, there is a technique called the worst idea technique. And this is a very, believe it or not, this is a very productive technique. Uh, in my TEDx talk here at the library, I talked about worst idea, how we evolved it into the silly idea technique, and how we used the silly idea to help the ASPCA get New Yorkers to invent large pit bulls that were formerly owned by drug dealers. That's the story, right? That's an impossible challenge. And we succeeded at that actually using a version of the worst idea we invented called the silly idea. But let's go with the worst idea. So I, I tried to find <laughs> what I thought would be the worst idea you could think of for a TEDx talk, right? And um, this one came about because uh, uh, an Olympic speed skater, uh, he got a silver medal uh, in speed skating from, from Chicago, has written a book on design thinking, which is sort of one of the hot terms in ideation these days. Because he was coming to New York on a book tour, he contacted me and said, you know, because this is a small community of ideators, right? He said, could you help me sort of promote this book in the New York area? And I said, sure, and we got to be friends. And he referred me to his friend at the Naperville uh, TEDx. Okay, and so the fellow I'm going to share with you here, and I'd like to introduce him. Oh, this is, uh, I've lost you here today. I mean, he's doing really stupid ideas, okay? And by the way, this is used by a lot of people now. If you look at Aaron Sorkin on his master class, he's, he's got these students around him, the screenwriter, and he said, oh, I don't want a good ideas. Come up with all bad ones. You know, that's a technique you can use. All right, so let me introduce you to blues pianist Daryl Davis, huge guy, just, you know, Cool. And he's played, he played with Muddy Waters and B.B. King, and he tours the world playing the pianist, 
piano, excuse me. <laughs> Playing the piano, yes. Um, and so, but he, for me, qualifies as the worst possible notion for a TEDx talk. And, um, and this is half of the title, Why is a, I as a Black Man Attend KKK Rallies? Which is true. He attends KKK rallies. And this happened because he had a, a period of racial um, uh, inequality, if you will. He was, he, had a Cubs, he was a Cub Scout. He was carrying a banner. All the other troop mates were white. They had him up front, which I thought was nice. And people started throwing things at him because he was uh, black. And he couldn't understand that, nor can we, right? But, and so he began to research this. And at the time, in Baltimore, he said, well, I need to find out what's going on here. And so <laughs> he calls up the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan in Maryland, who also happened to be a police officer. And he said, can we meet? You know, and so they met and they talked and he tells funny stories about what happened. They thought they were going to shoot one another and all this stuff. Long story short, they became friends. Um, and the Grand Wizard invited him to attend Ku Klux Klan meetings. And ultimately, he left the Ku Klux Klan because he decided, you know, because uh, Daryl is such a nice person, what was I thinking, okay? And that, that particular talk has now almost two million hits that TEDx talk, and it should. It's a wonderful talk. And again, this is referenced in the handout. You can link it and watch it if you want. I, I, for me, it was incredibly inspiring. Okay, so um, I put this just, these are some of the techniques we use, and there are a lot, as you can see. Um, I'll just, because we have a two minutes, I'll tell one, one other story. Uh, I'm telling it because it's a local story. So we, we got a call from Clairol. They weren't, uh, uh, actually they were owned by P&G at the time. Procter & Gamble had bought them. The, the assignment was to create a new gray solutions, gray solutions hair color, gray, gray coverage hair color for older women. So we did ethnographies, they're called, in Stanford. So we recruited a, a bunch of older women who color their hair. Before we went there, we, these are in-home ethnographies, they're called. Before we went there, we had them all do a collage of before and after. How they felt before they had their hair color and how they felt after they did their hair color, okay? And so I'm, I was over in the Cove. We went all around Stanford. I'm over in the Cove at a woman's house. She brings out her collage. On the left-hand sheet, it looked like Armageddon. I'm not kidding you. It, you know, I don't want to say death and disease, but it was this incredibly dark series of collages. And I'm going, what? And then on the right, it was people running through fields and brightness and light and all this kind of stuff. And so I said to her, what? I didn't say what the heck, but I'm thinking, what, what's going on here? And she said something I will never forget, and this was a key insight in the product that we've developed and now has become a success in the marketplace. She said, if I don't feel good about myself, I can't give back to the world. And this hair color makes me feel good about myself. Oh my God. Talk about a higher order principle here and how p powerful that is, right? And help me understand why my wife would go spend a two or three hundred dollars to get her hair color, right? Okay. So these are all the speaker resources, all the TEDx talks I referenced. Um, the links are there. These are the books, the TED Talks, Official Guide to Public Speaking. If you go online, there, there are a lot of TED books out there. This, in my opinion, if you have a talk that you want to create and you have that in your head, as you work through this, you'll guaranteed, the um, Chris Anderson book, guaranteed you will get some ideas on how to structure it. And then I just threw in some articles that we've done. Um, that first one, Boost Your Creativity, is that technique uh, based on the Fran Stryker morphological matchup. And then there's, these are some other, oh, the Virtual Brainstorm one, the trend, and then Creativity in the Workplace. And this is, uh, the last one is how to crystallize an idea, and we call it the billboard technique. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're sort of, sort of done, right? Um, And, and these are the, 
these are the books. I'll just say, um, you can get the one on the left for a penny, I'm not kidding, on uh, Amazon, because it's, uh, it's out of print now. It's on creativity in the workplace, 99% inspiration. Uh, but it was picked as the AMA's membership offering in 1994, so they mailed out 50,000 copies, so there are a lot of copies out there, so you can get it for a penny online. Idea Stormers is kind of the, I don't want to say the masterwork, but that's 250 pages of all our experiences helping companies come up with stuff. And then, of course, 21 Days to the Big Idea is the, 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 the daily routine to help you get a big idea. And that was it. Okay. This is perfect. So it's like eight minutes of. We hit the timing, I think, exactly right. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, we're, we, we, we have till eight. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Do we need to get uh, her a mic, or do you want to just yell it? Or oh, we have a mic? OK. OK. Yeah, in my case, I, I, I have a bias. Repeat the question. Oh, um, so the, the question was, what about visuals, if you will, on a TED, TED Talk? Um, my bias, um, I, I think the figure is about 30% of the talks have no visuals. And the reason is because they want people to focus on you and not be up there. That's part of it. Also, people sometimes use visuals poorly. They take away. Now, obviously, if you're showing videos of undersea water creatures, and you know you're going to need you're going to need that. Um, I normally we don't facilitate with with PowerPoint. We we stay away from PowerPoint. And of course, I have 80 slides here. But but in, for the most part, we don't use PowerPoint. In my talk, my TEDx talk, um, I intentionally did not use any PowerPoint. Um, uh, now there was sort of a there was a teleprompter a bit, but I structured the talk so I'd say hello, oh, well, I could do that, or I, I'd say something, and then I in my mind I had five stories I wanted to tell, and as soon as I, because you you don't you don't have notes right, and it's pressure you're up there the lights are on you you're I don't know about you but I was I, I was nervous right oh my god, um, and so but I knew. If I could start it off, which I could, and then I go into the naming the new Ben and Jerry's ice cream, right? Um, using a slang dictionary, that's my first story, and I go around, I know that I can get there. And I had done the talk so many times in my mind that I didn't need visuals. And it was not, the stories was what is important, okay? So I guess I would say, you should only have as many visuals as you need, <laughs> and no more. You know what I mean? I would try to stay away. It's hard to say, but you know, um, I think in these times we over rely on PowerPoint and over rely on visual. So I would try to, I would try to lessen that unless you really need them. Especially if you have a graph or something that is critical for showing something. Well, then you show that. What's your talk title on? What's the subject matter? Personal branding from birth, sounds good. Who wants to go? I'd like to go. Okay, good. You've got five that are already showing up. Okay. Hartford, December 3rd. Okay. A few PowerPoint slides very effectively, um, either to get a laugh or emotional. Um, they're not like the slide that had say 20 items on it that's not what she you know yeah that that really emotionally like for instance that note that was a great that's one you know that's a great powerpoint because it's like you know you can see the note and it gets you so that's what they use them for yeah any other questions yes I, uh, Mary, Mary, I'll bring over the mic. What are the five W's? Who, what, when, where, how, why? Yeah, and um, if you're ever in a situation where you can't think of something, like if you're interviewing somebody, and you know, oh my God, I can't think of any, uh, this is a weird example, but you could just say, um, now who did you grow up with? What time do you, why did you do, tell me about why you did, where were you, where were you, 
was most informative for her. And why did that work? You know, you can make stuff, you start the sentence with a who, what, where, when, how, why, and it will trigger ideas no matter what, where you are or what you do. And in fact, you might, an extension of that technique, if you're trying to come up with your talk title, it's like, who would be a kid? Why would it be a kid? What and where would the kid be? I mean, if you hit all those buttons and levers, it could be pretty interesting. Yes. Um, you mentioned that, uh, like corporate brainstorms, or brainstorming with groups doesn't work. Why are they yes. Yeah, because I haven't done a particularly good job of telling the world why they don't work. I'm kidding. But um, the books I've written are about the fact that brainstorming doesn't work. If you think about why it doesn't work, think about it. Hey, who's got some ideas? You've been thinking about Oreo cookies for 100 years and you're asking me if I got any ideas? I'm going to kill you. I did get out, right? But if you say, go think of a cake or whatever, so it's all about stimuli. That's what will trigger ideas. And the, I think several reasons. One, people, that's the way it's always been done. Two, when it was first introduced in the late 1930s, it was an important technique with holding judgment. It was invented by Alex Osborne, the O of BBDO ad agency. And there were two good insights. Get a lot of ideas. That's helpful, right? You don't stop at your first one. 21 days is get 21 ideas, not one, right? So that is a valid principle. And withholding judgment is also valid, right? John, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard of. John gets pissed, you know, and it shuts down. So you need a positive environment, right? Right? But that's just the start. In these times when you really want to trigger something new, you have to add stimuli. To answer your question, I think people don't know, number one. People don't know how to, which techniques work for different kinds of challenges. People don't know how to customize those techniques, right? And people don't have the time or they think they don't have the time to really design those sessions effectively. Right? And so that's my whole life if it's been spent trying to tell the world about this. And that's why I've written these books, um, to let people know. And I wrote, them, I wrote these books as much for smaller companies as large ones, because the large ones can afford our fees, the smaller guys maybe not. And so that's why I've, I've written these books, to help some of the smaller guys. Any other questions? We have a couple, just a couple minutes left, and then I'm going to, we started at five after, so we may go to two or three minutes after, but um, any other questions? Yeah, actually, you sort of started answering it. Um, so you have 20 plus techniques. Um, are you listening for certain, what, what makes you pick one over the other? In it? Okay, we're in advanced brainstorming now, <laughs> or advanced ideation. The question was, what makes you pick one technique over another? Um, part of it is experience and empirical evidence, if you will, uh, and a big part of it is the challenge. If it's a strategy challenge, we know that questioning assumptions, problem redefinition, 20 questions will work great for that. If it's a new product development challenge, we'll use customer target wishing, we'll use semantic intuition, we'll use um, you know, trend triggers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if it's a cost-cutting challenge, we might do a wish technique, et cetera, et cetera. So depending on the kind of challenge, uh, you, you will use the, te the technique. That's based on the experience. And that a lot of that stuff is in the, in the Idea Stormer's book. But it's really just based on, on our empirical evidence about which is going to work for different. Because we, we've tried a lot in different areas. And we sort of know from, have, from these 1,000, 1,500 ideation sessions which kind of work and which don't. Yes. Sure. I'm Kathy Blood. Hi, everyone. Um, I have a lot of clients who work on um, a lot of content development and struggling with them for idea generation for websites because long form content is very valuable. And I have, you know, 50 different ways for them to think about content for their business, but it doesn't always generate good content ideas. And I see you have this boost your creativity ideation techniques for writers. Does it differ a lot from this type of thing for content development? Your, um, this article versus... That article is really a reflection of the Fran Stryker. So that, that is more for generating, quote, story ideas. I, th I think the you know, idea stormers, 21 days, they will have techniques in there that will 
help you uh, generate successfully content for these guys. I mean, worst idea, I mean, any of these techniques up there, great thinkers, et cetera, et cetera, will help you generate content for those guys. So I would, and, and by the way, you don't have to do them all at once. You could do it over lunch, you know, spend half hour with these folks, do a worst idea technique, you'll generate some, uh, then you go to the next one, right? So, and, and by the way, guys, this is, um, this is not something that's controllable. You know, we'll do an ideation session. We'll generate 200 ideas in a, in a day or something. But we don't know what's going to really work. And it's, so it's a numbers game. And you have to give up some of the control. So it's a matter of continually trying different stuff till you get some stuff that'll work. Did I answer your question? OK. <laughs> Yeah, you got to read the book. Yes. Um, last question, anybody? Before I have Mary come up, Mary's just going to give a short ad for the speakers uh, series or speakers group, and pr primarily the speakers group. We good? Okay. Well, first, let's give it up for Brian. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. It's always fun. I've listened to him a million times, and I'm always learning things. And also, Ferguson Library, please uh, thank them. They've put all of this together for us. Um, Ryan was our kickoff. We have October um, improv. If you want to uh, loosen up, learn how to speak and present as a frog or whatever, uh, as, <laughs> as Alice said, it's supposed to be a lot of fun. So come in October and then November, we have our own Sean Bradley that's leaving right now, probably to work on his speech, <laughs> um, and two other TEDx uh, speakers will be a panel. And so that will be where they share their superpower of how they develop their talk and then it'll be a lot of question and answers so you can ask them anything so um, so those are the three in this series and then we have a, um, a professional speaking group and uh, we're taking applications for that the first one starts next Friday so if you make money doing speeches and you want to share you know your learning and also learn from others it's a great opportunity for you to uh, to network and and learn how to build your business more. So that's the professional group that Alice talked about. And then in March of next year, we're going to have a pilot kickoff, which is aspiring speakers. So if you don't know how to do speaking and you want to do more of it or you want to build your business more, that's the intent of that one. And there'll probably be even more as we kind of figure out, as Alice said, how we're going to be creating this, this community of speakers. So anyway, um, questions on any of that? I'm around if you want to have any questions on it. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming tonight. Yeah.